some of the things that we've learned, certainly I think that maybe uh, has corrected our, our thinking. When we think about Jacob, we think about Esau and so forth, is, uh, is the one thing is that uh, Jacob really isn't who he's made out to be sometimes in, in the vernacular when we refer to him as Jacob, uh, the dirty, sneaky thief. Uh, because uh, in a sense, that's a, paraphr a paraphrase of what the Bible says about him, but who says it is Esau, who hates him. Uh, so that's not exactly a, a credible uh, character reference. Uh, and uh, uh, yet what we find is that in that opening scene where there is the issue of the birthright between the two kids, there's been the prophecy still in their mother's womb, which she says uh, to the Lord, what is going on inside of me? Which has probably been a few pregnant women say that to the Lord over the years. And because uh, and, she feels like there's a war going on. And she says, uh, well, in a sense, there is. You know, you're going to have two boys and the younger will rule over uh, the older, which certainly would be not how things were normally done. And, uh, and again, at the birth of the two children, Esau becomes the older. Jacob is the younger. He is holding on to his heel coming out. So he is called Jacob or heel catcher. Uh, and then Esau uh, ends up being this person that uh, that we've you know, kind of coined the phrase from uh, one writer, uh, uh, he's a living beer commercial. And we call him Big Red uh, because of his, his lifestyle choices uh, and, uh, and so forth. And he becomes a, the picture of, of so much in our culture today, the person that lives for the now, that lives for pleasure, that is pleasure dominated, that would rather have enjoy something in the short term rather than sacrifice for the long term. His life is all about instant gratification and he doesn't really care about the things of God and uh, and his his name and his descendants become known for that is uh, as well let's take a look at uh, there's a reference again to that uh, in his choice of a wife or wives in the first couple of verses we would say Esau's choices of wives compounded his broken relationships that he's got already with his brother and uh, in other family members in the first five verses, it says, this is the genealogy of Esau, who is Edom. And that phrase is going to be mentioned three times. Esau took his wives from the daughter of Canaan, Adah, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, Aholibama, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zebion, the Hivite, and Bashmoth, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nebaioth, and Adar bore Elah. Eliphaz to Esau, and Bashmath bore Ruel, and Aholibama bore uh, Yaus, uh, Yaalam, and Korah. These were the sons of Esau who were born to him in the land of Canaan. So the broken relationships begin by marrying these, these gals, these Canaanite uh, gals. And we already know it, remember the story of it, uh, but it's uh, emphasized once again here. And it seems to pick out these three gals who all of the kids come from. Uh, it's a little confusing, and we won't deal with all of the wives because there's many. He marries the, these. He marries uh, Ishmael's, uh, one of his descendants. Uh, he marries others. There's two gals with the same name, Bashemoth, or base math is what it looks like there. So that's a little confusing. You have two wives with the same uh, same name. So it all is a little confusing. But the emphasis on is marrying the, the Canaanites. Uh, and that's such a big deal because Abraham is so concerned over that that when it comes time for his son Isaac to have a wife, he sends his servant all the way back to where he came from, from uh, Mesopotamia, to find a wife there. And basically tells the servant, whatever you do, don't let him marry one of the Canaanites. And then you've got the same thing with uh, with Isaac, the concern over what's going to become of Jacob, since he's the promised child, we'll send him after the incident of the birthright. And uh, and is all saying, basically, I'm going to kill you. Uh, so he flees. But again, the purpose of him going to Padan, Aram, or Mesopotamia was to uh, get a wife as well. So he would not marry a Canaanite. Why not? Well, what we know from the Bible as well as from, uh, from history and archaeology is that we would say they were probably the most uh, sexually immoral people as a culture that has ever existed on the, on the planet as far as we, uh, we know. 
the things that they, they did or were into uh, should never even be mentioned in mixed company. It was just very bad. And if actually you go through and read the warnings that are actually in scripture, they'll say, don't be like them because they do this, this, and they list about 16 different things. Uh, and so there's the, there's the concern. Back in chapter 26, when Esau gets married, in verse 34, it says, when Esau was 40 years old, he took as wives Judith, the daughter of Beri, the Hittite, and Vashma, the daughter of Elom, the Hittite. And they were a grief to mine, of mine, to Isaac and Rebekah. So having these gals in their midst was a, a constant uh, sore point with them. It created uh, a brokenness in their relationship, uh, in which continues on with his relationship with, uh, with Jacob. Uh, of, uh, of Solomon, it said, who did the, the similar thing later in 1 Kings 11, 4. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. Certainly that was a, that was a, great, uh, a great concern. Uh, he was entering into relationships with people that he should not have a relationship with, obviously. Um, uh, and we, we've seen that, that happen in other people. In the life of, of Lot, what happens to him? He could have stayed with Abraham. He could have stayed with his uncle there. He could have enjoyed the blessing, the prosperity of God and so forth. We get a little taste of Egypt. Uh, and when their herdsmen are quarreling one another and they have to separate, Abraham, of course, says, listen, if you go to the left, I go to the right. If you go to the right, I go to the left. Your choice, whatever you want. He looked down toward the plains of, of Sodom and they reminded him of Egypt, so he chose to go there. How did all that work out for him? Well, he ends up not only on the plains, in the city. Not only in the city, but an elder in the city. And when the whole thing is over at the end of Lot's life, after he builds and allows himself to build relationships with people he shouldn't have really been with, well, he ends up with a, in a cave committing incest with his two daughters. That's, a, that's a, the, the summary of, uh, of Lot at the end of his life. Everything he owned was burnt to a crisp, uh, and all he had left was that life, life in the darkness of a, uh, of a cave. Are we to have relationships with other people that aren't believers? Yes for the purpose of sharing the gospel to, with them. That, that's the reason. Uh, it shouldn't actually be because we want them and that's our closest friends and that's who we talk with. They're our sounding board. They're the ones that we run our ideas by. We're they're the ones that we allow to influence our lives. Every time we get into that, we're kind of going down the road of Esau and in the long run, it will create nothing but brokenness in our, in our relationships. Uh, and so we need to be careful and we need to realize there is a purpose for us trying to have and establish relationships with, uh, with non-believers. One of the worst things <laughs> about being a pastor is that it seems like everybody I hang out with is a Christian. You're thinking, I think I would like that. You know, but, uh, you know, one of the things that, you know, that I, I gave up in a sense when I stopped building uh, stained glass windows for a living is that ability to interact on a regular basis and be with non, non-believers and have some kind of influence and be able to, you know, share my faith and, uh, and so forth. Um, I remember one of the uh, guys, uh, David uh, uh, Tamala, that used to do worship for us uh, at a point in time and would drive over from the other side of the island and Wonderful guy, great, uh, great Bible teachers filled in for me on Sunday mornings as well. Carpenter by trade, does construction. He had a pretty good job for a couple of years working as a kind of a liaison between a, uh, uh, an interior designer uh, and basically the contractors that he would work with. And it probably beat uh, Pound and Nails in the hot sun. And a uh, pretty good job. Uh, and he tells me one day, yeah, I'm done with that job. I'm uh, moving on to... Uh, uh, you know, another another job and everything. I'm going to go back to the construction uh, industry and stuff. I go, oh, are they downsizing? He goes, no, no, no. I just said, I've shared the gospel with everybody there. Uh, a couple of people have come to faith in the Lord. There's nobody left, you know, for me to witness to. So it's, it's time to move on. That's the only reason he's got the job is to be a witness for Jesus Christ. And when he's done, he's ready to go find another job where he can start all, all over again. We talked about uh, guys that play in the NFL that are believers then in the off-season, get together and pray that God would trade them or, or one of the other believers they know to the teams where there needs to be a greater witness for Jesus Christ. They love playing football, but the reason they're in the NFL is to be a witness for Jesus Christ. 
Uh, it's just a different priority. And, uh, and we just don't see that, certainly uh, with uh, Esau and his choice of wives here, they were actually very detrimental to him, and we'll see to his descendants as well. The second thing about the brokenness here, it leads to prophecy concerning the future of Esau and Jacob. Now, at the time when, and again, where uh, Esau trades away his birthright for a, a, a bowl of red stew, we'll, we'll talk about that more in a minute because that's where his, the name and the name of his descendants come from. But the other big incident in the life is he's hoping to have the, the blessing of his dad. And you remember the whole story, the deception of, uh, of Rebecca, and she dresses uh, Jacob up to, you know, look like uh, the, the brother the best she could, and she prepares the meal for him, and he goes in, and, uh, and they deceive the father, and he gets the blessing. Uh, again, it wasn't the right thing to do. The end did not justify the means, but the end was right. Jacob was supposed to get the blessing. That's what God had said. Isaac was out of the will of God. The mom was trying to do the right thing, but do it in the wrong way. But you remember when Esau comes in later, then He's crying out for the blessing. And uh, this is what uh, Isaac says uh, to him uh, in Genesis 27, 39. Behold, your dwelling shall be of the fatness of the earth. You're going to be okay in terms of prosperity. And of the dew of heaven from above. Uh, by your sword you shall live. Uh, and you shall serve your brother. And it shall come to pass when you become restless. That you shall break his yoke from your neck. So again already mentioned that his descendants become known as Edom or the Edomites. So was there a time, was this fulfilled when the older served the younger? And it did under, under King David, under King David's reign. In 2 Samuel 8, 14, it says of David that he also put garrisons in Edom. That's the place we're talking about. Throughout all Edom, he put garrisons and all the Edomites became David's servants and the Lord preserved David wherever he went. What Isaac said would happen did happen in this, we might call it the anti-blessing, but this prophecy that he spoke over Esau, uh, it all had to do with uh, the brokenness in their relationships. And then later, was there a time when that yoke was, well, when he no longer served his, uh, those descendants, and that happened in 2 Kings 8.20. There it says, in the days of Edom, in the days, uh, in his days, Edom revolted against Judah's authority and made a king over themselves. So Uram uh, went to Zaire and all of his chariots with him. Then he rose by night and attacked the Edomites who had surrounded him and the captains of the chariots and the troops fled to their tents. Thus Edom had been in revolt against Judah's authority to this day. So Joram or Uram, the fifth of Judah's kings, is no longer able to continue to hold the Edomites under their authority. They rebel against them. What Isaac said to Esau absolutely uh, came, came true. Uh, Esau's choice of wives compounded his broken relationships. It actually, we'll see, drove him uh, away and out of the promised land and into another location. And, uh, and that's in verses 68. We'd say that uh, he would not remain in the land. Verse 6 says, Then Esau took his wives, his sons, his daughters, and all the persons of his household, his cattle and all of his animals, and all his goods which he had gained in the land of Canaan, and went to a country away from the presence of his brother. For there were possessions, uh, their possessions was too great for them to dwell together, <clears throat> and the land where they were strangers could not support them because of their livestock. So Esau dwelt in Mount Seir, and there's the phrase again, Esau is Edom. Now, it's kind of interesting because when Jacob comes back from Padan Aram after 20 years, where is Esau coming from to meet him? He's not in Canaan. He's already in Mount Seir. And so this idea that, well, they just, you know, had too much stuff is uh, it's kind of like spin or polite or whatever because he's, he's already gone. He's already departed. Uh, and a lot of that, again, had to do with his choice of wives, his kids, what his life was all about. Because he could care less about the things of God. This is God's land. This is the promised land. Jacob's going to be here. He gets the land. Well, I'm just going to go somewhere else. I don't care about my birthright. I would have liked the blessing from my dad because maybe I would have gotten more rights and more inheritance and so forth. Uh, but this guy is a guy that wanted it all, all now. So he says, I I'm just leaving and going somewhere else. Esau's family, again, is associated, we, we would say, with uh, the place Edom. 
and all of his descendants are called the Edomites. And that's kind of interesting given the fact where the name comes from. Because again, it goes back to the story of when he trades away his birthright for, well, a red stew. That's, uh, that's the idea. It was a constant reminder. Uh, again, back in Genesis 25, verse 29, is where it took place. You know the story. Now Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary, poor guy. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore his name was called Edom. And Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, look, I'm about to die. What is this birthright to me? So his name is a constant reference to this occasion where he said, birthright, I could care less. Just give me some of that red meat. That's all I really care about, or that red, red stew. Okay, we're going to call you Edom. We, we call them Big Red. And, uh, but all of his descendants, every time they said their name, it was a reference back to their father's father's father who said, I could care less about the things of God. Birthright, it was a spiritual thing that he was going to receive. Follow after the God of his father. Follow after Isaac, after Abraham. He's like, I, I don't care about that stuff. I don't care about my father. Uh, I don't care about knowing the Lord. Just, just give me something to eat here. You know, again, we always get the, you know, what Esau says later is, yeah, he deceived me. I, I don't really see a deception here. You know, what do you say? Birthright? Oh, that birthright. Well, I didn't know. No, he just, he's just like birthright. I don't care. And again, the commentary in Hebrews is very clear about that we've read before, that, that Esau just could care less about spiritual things and the things of God. But their very name, the Edomites, is a reference to this occasion. Now, in contrast to somebody like Esau is somebody like Moses. Now, Esau was all about instant gratification. He wanted it. He wanted it now. He was always up for a, a hunt, whether it was something to eat or, or a woman. He was, he, was, he was up for it. Like I said, we say, he is the living beer commercial. And, uh, and there's, a, there's a lot of guys that are out there like him. Uh, I heard one sociologist refer to it as uh, uh, they have a, 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 a Peter Pan mindset. You know, Peter Pan, all these boys actually never grow up. That's happening. <laughs> and that's, uh, that's, that's Esau. No, no responsibilities. But in contrast to that, worldview and that perspective is uh, is Moses. The writer of Hebrews says of Moses in uh, Hebrews eleven twenty four by faith Moses when he became of age refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to suffer affliction with God's people rather to enjoy the passing pleasure of sin esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt for he looked to the reward. Moses, again, raised in Pharaoh's household, the prince of Egypt, in line to be Pharaoh, uh, the most powerful ruler on the planet at the time. Tremendous education, tremendous affluence, uh, great wealth, uh, great privilege. And he says, Moses says, according to the writer of Hebrews, I would rather give all of this temporary pleasure up and be associated with God's people and suffer the affliction and whatever I've got to go through because I know someday I'll get a reward in heaven. So I'll suffer in the short term if I have to, to gain something for all eternity. Good perspective. And he is the opposite of Esau. Esau says, uh, I'm not even really worried about next month. I'm just kind of concerned about the next meal coming up here. And uh, don't even talk to me about afterlife, heaven, or, or any of those things. Moses was willing to suffer in the short term to enjoy the blessings of God for all eternity. Also, Esau's family will live uh, in a place not only called by that name, the Edomites, but a place known as Mount Seir. Now, we uh, talked about this a little bit uh, because when, when Jacob does come back and there is that reconciliation, we said that uh, Esau was coming from Mount Seir, and that's the idea or the place we call Petra today or the Rock City Fortress there. Uh, he ends up living <clears throat> in present-day southern uh, Jordan, and the Moabites live in northern present-day Jordan. I've got a little map for you. So there's Edom, or the Edomites. You've got, uh, again, the Sea of Galilee up there at the north, the Dead Sea uh, coming down. Again, where it says Philistria, and all the, the squares are associated with the tribes of Israel. 
<coughs> but you can see where Edom is, where the Moabites are. See uh, uh, Amman, as in Amman, Jordan. So that's all present-day Jordan. If you go to the next slide, uh, then a, there's a, a, an overlay of a current map. So where he lives, where Mount Seir is, there is in southern Jordan, or the rock city of uh, Petra. And uh, you can go on to the next slide. And uh, you probably, I don't know if you saw this in the Indiana Jones movie, or <clears throat> we've talked about it before. That's how you enter. That's the one way you get in. It was enough for maybe one guy or a gal on a horse or walking, and that was it. So they were very proud of the fact that they could defend themselves against anybody. They had a water source in there. Uh, you go on to the next side, and there's uh, lots of uh, incredible uh, building and the sandstone carving that they did and, and so forth. <clears throat> this is where Esau was from. This is where, where he lived and, uh, and becomes known uh, for uh, this particular place. Uh, and God has a, a purpose for moving him and allowing him to go there. So the third thing we'd say uh, about Esau's uh, family living in this area is that it's mentioned in prophecy. Now it's condemned, he's condemned by the prophets. Obadiah writes a whole thing, his whole uh, prophecy is a condemnation of the Edomites and where they live in this place, and he makes, uh, uh, makes reference to it. Uh, but also we know from our study of prophecy and from Daniel, this ends up being the place, Daniel said there'd be a last seven year period of tribulation, the great tribulation or Jacob's trouble. We won't, we won't go through a lot of details, but remember in the second half of that period where Paul says, don't let anyone deceive you in any way for that day will not occur until the, until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawless, lawlessness appears, the man doomed to destruction. Uh, he will uh, exalt and oppose himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped. Here's the part I want to get to. So that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. So when he does that, this last world ruler, then Jesus in Matthew 24 on the Olivet Discourse says to the Jews, you better get out of town. Where they get out of town is they cross the Jordan and they go to this place. And they're able to protect themselves, or at least God is able to supernaturally protect them from the forces of the Antichrist. It's from that place that eventually they cry out and recognize that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus stood on the Mount of Olives. He looked over the, uh, uh, the city of the people that had rejected him there in Jerusalem and said, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In other words, until they recognize me as Messiah, that's what brings me back. The Jews in this area will recognize and call out to Jesus as Messiah. Zechariah says, they will look on the one they have pierced. They will mourn for the one as one mourns for an only child. And they will recognize him. Jesus comes back to planet Earth with us. And where he comes back to, Isaiah says in Isaiah 63, is to this place in the Hebrew, it's called Basra. And there's quite a scene and a description of, again, what we call Armageddon really is a war. And there are different facets and segments of it. And this is one where Jesus then saves them and marches across those plains back to the city of Jerusalem, back to the Mount of Olives, where he stands on the Mount of Olives, and it, uh, and it splits in two. I won't keep going with uh, all the other things that are going on. But this place becomes a very significant place in prophecy. It's where the remnant of Jews will flee to. It's where Jesus will come back to uh, one day. Uh, so Esau's family will live in this area uh, that is mentioned in prophecy. And, uh, and because of that, we would say the problems with Jacob and Esau become part of God's plan for the future. They have some problems. They didn't exactly get along. But it was all part of God's plan. It was God's design that they would have problems. It was God's design that they would not get along. It was God's design that Esau would leave and go to this area because he has a, a place to prepare for the remnant of the Jews at the end of time. Uh, God is orchestrating all these events, and we'll, we'll read some scriptures in a moment, a moment to support that idea. God says several times through, through Moses, I'm doing this. I'm giving him out here. I'm putting him out there, which says that sometimes God brings problem people into our lives for a reason. <laughs> Sometimes he wants to move us along. 
down the road, to trust him more, maybe even a different place or a different location, whatever it might be. God, in his sovereignty, will sometimes make things more difficult for us by people, but he's got a reason for it. It's hard to trust him in those times. Why do I have to work with that person? Because I love you. <laughs> I've got a plan here. <laughs> I'm going to let them really irritate you because I want to do something in, uh, in your life. We actually see it in, uh, in the book of Acts. In Acts, uh, Acts 15, remember, uh, Paul is uh, befriended by a guy named Barnabas. Uh, Paul is Saul of Tarsus, really the early church. Doesn't want to have anything to do with that guy because they weren't really sure if he was really a Christian or not. And if he's not, then, you know, he can end up killing you, you know, because he's a persecutor of the church. But Barnabas goes out and reaches out to him, remember, and takes him up to Antioch and makes him part of the ministry and gives him a platform for teaching. And he, he becomes uh, one of the leaders in that ministry and, uh, and in that church. And then, and then the two of them go off on, on the, the first missionary journey of the church recorded there for us in Acts. And they certainly had their tribulations and, and so forth, but God ministered to them, do, did miraculous things, and God established churches all over Asia Minor through them. Uh, it was a great first trip. And then they got ready to go again, right? And they just went along. No, they didn't go together, did they? Uh, why? Because uh, Paul didn't want to take uh, John Mark, who was Barnabas's, basically his, his nephew. John Mark goes along the first time because Uncle Barney is going and figures it'd be a good time. Uh, and uh, and uh, part of the way through, he bails out and says, Man, I doesn't know what I signed up for. You know, the malaria and whatever else is going on and the hardship. I don't like the idea of getting beaten and thrown in prison. You guys just have a good time, you know, but uh, I'm out of here. So John Mark goes back. So the second time out, Paul's not real thrilled with this idea. Listen to how it goes down in Acts 15, 37. Now, Barnabas was, and if you <laughs> were to underline something, notice Barnabas, Barnabas was determined to take with him John called Mark. But Paul, notice, insisted that they should not take uh, with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. He didn't continue on the trip. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed. Man, that's too bad. You know, these guys... You know, Barnabas had done so much for Paul. They had experienced so much of the incredible things of God together. They were such a great ministry team. Now this contentious, this sharp dispute broke out. And God was all, all, in, all in it. Because now he had two, two missionary teams. Uh, now, now Barnabas uh, would go with John Mark and sell to Cyprus. Where to this day, uh, the Christians there trace their spiritual lineage back to a guy named John Bar uh, Mark and, and Barnabas. And we know that Acts, the book of Acts, then continues to follow the, follow the ministry of, of Paul and Silas and how, how God, uh, God used them uh, in very unique ways that maybe would have not have happened with Paul and Barnabas alone. But the, the ministry effort, the missionary effort, doubled at that point because God allowed or caused a sharp dispute to break out between these two people. Now, did God kind of work things out later? Sure. Uh, and Paul makes reference to John Mark, and he's a faithful guy, and sent him to me and, uh, in one of his last letters and everything. But sometimes God allows bad feelings <laughs> between, between people who formerly loved one another, who are, are, are brothers or sisters in the Lord, and sometimes he'll allow it uh, to move us on and, uh, and get us going. And sometimes it's to... Uh, it's to launch us out into uh, is to ministries we see here in the book of Acts. But uh, let me give you some scriptural support for this idea of what's going on with Esau and getting him to Mount Seir. In Deuteronomy 2, 4 is where Moses says, And command the people, saying, You're about to pass through the territory of your brethren. They're coming out of Egypt. The descendants of Esau who live in Seir, they will be afraid of you. Therefore, watch yourselves carefully. Do not meddle with them. For I will not give you any of their land. No, not so much as uh, one footstep. Because I have given Mount Seir to Esau as a possession. Who, got, who gave Mount Seir to Esau? God gave it to him. God says, uh, that's where I wanted him. I caused a, a problem in his relationship with Jacob because I wanted to get him there. Because I've got a plan in the future uh, that needs to be fulfilled. I need him there. 
later in verse 12 of that chapter, it says the Horites formerly dwelt in Seir, but the descendants of Esau uh, uh, disposed of them and destroyed them from before them and dwelt in their place, just as Israel did to the land of their possession, which the Lord gave them. God is saying through Moses, God gave the land of Israel to the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the same way God gave this land to the physical descendants of, of Esau. And God needs to get Esau out of Canaan and into this land for a purpose, and he gives it to them. Why? Because that land and this city needed to be built so it would be there for a Jewish remnant uh, during the tribulation period. Joshua would make reference to this as well in Joshua 24, 4. There he says, to Isaac, I gave, uh, to Isaac, I gave Jacob and Esau. To Esau, I gave the mountains of Seir to possess, but Jacob and his children went down to, down to Egypt. So there's a time where, and we'll make this comparison at the end, how were things going for Esau and going over there? Well, it seems like things are going pretty good. You know, he's got... He's got all these kids, uh, which is considered a really good thing. He's got, uh, he's got a lot of sheep and cattle and so forth, which is the measurement uh, of wealth and, uh, and blessing. Uh, and the other one was land. How's he doing? He's got a whole country. Well, he's doing pretty good. That guy Esau is really blessed, isn't he? Well, it would appear that way, wouldn't it? How's things going for Jacob, who's really walking with God, submitted to God, wrestled with God, surrendered to God, living to try to uh, live, uh, you know, there in Bethel and where God has him. Uh, well, he's in a tent. Uh, his, uh, his wife uh, that he loved passed away, you know, in childbirth. And, you know, his favorite son was killed by those animals because he doesn't know he's down in Egypt or anything. Kind of tough for him. I think I'd rather be Esau, don't you? Well, there's a lot of people that think that, that look in the short term and don't really think about the, the long term. Uh, and that's the problem with Esau. His choice of wives compounded the brokenness in the relationships. Esau's family would not remain in the land because, because of that or the results of that. And then third, Esau's family would refuse to help the children of God. We'll read <clears throat> verses 9 to 14 and then talk about two incidents where this, uh, this, this takes place. Verse 9, and this is the genealogy of Esau, the father of the Edomites, in Mount Seir. Uh, these are the names of Esau's sons, Eliphaz, the son of Adah, the wife of Esau, and Ra'u, the son of Bashmath, the wife of Esau. And the sons of Eliphaz were Taman, Omar, Zepho, Gatam, and Kenaz. And Timna was the concubine of Eliphaz, Esau's son. And she bore Amalek. We're going to talk about him in a minute to Eliphaz. These were the sons of Adah, Esau's wife. These were the sons of Ra'u, uh, Nahath, Zerah, Shammah, and Mizah. These were the sons of Bashmath, Esau's wife. These were the sons of Aholibama, Esau's wife. Sorry, I just laughed every time I read that this week. <coughs> Aholibama, because we're kind of wishing he, he was. Esau's <laughs> wife, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion, uh, and uh, she bore to Esau, Ya'us, uh, Ya'alam, and Korah. So two incidents uh, here where they refuse to help the children uh, of Israel. As a result, uh, they end up being condemned by God. And uh, the whole uh, prophecy of Obadiah is all about the Edomites and, uh, and these, uh, these incidents. But uh, we're introduced here in verse 12. I want to point this out before we go any further. Uh, now it says, Now Timna was the concubine of Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she bore Amalek to Eliphaz. Amalek, where the Amalekites come from. Uh, it's the Amalekites in Exodus 17 that refuse to allow the children of Israel to pass this way. You know, just we didn't look on a, on a big map, but, uh, but certainly uh, you can see coming up through southern Jordan from Egypt, you know, two, three million people coming out of the Exodus with Moses on their way to Canaan, on their way to the promised land, they've got to pass right through. They want to pass right through, but the Amalekites, the descendants of Esau, refuse to let them pass by. Uh, and thus, in Exodus 17, we have uh, this story, verse 8. Now, uh, Amalek came and fought with Israel and Raphadim, 
And Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hands. Joshua did, as Moses said to him, and fought Amalek. And uh, Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hand became heavy. So they took a stone and put, him, uh, and put it under him. And he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side, one on the other side, with his hands were steady. Uh, until he, uh, the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua that I will utterly blot out of the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called it, the Lord is my banner, Jehovah Nishi. For he said, uh, because the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. They just want to pass through. No war, no beef. God told us, this is not our land. It's your land. We're not to meddle with it. We're just to, not one foot of it. We're just trying to, to get through. Why is God so heavy with the, uh, the Amalekites at this point? Well, it helps understand what exactly they were doing. In Deuteronomy 25 we get that reference in verse 17. There again, Moses writing, Remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you were coming out of Egypt, how he met you on the way and attacked your rear ranks. All the stragglers at your rear, rear when you were tired and weary, uh, and he did not fear God. Who was at the rear of these two or three main people? It was the elderly. Uh, it was the handicapped. Uh, it was some of the children. So Amalek, the Amalekites don't come and go, you're not coming through here and face them with their armies. I mean, uh, again, the children of Israel, as we read, forced them into that, but they had to because of what they were doing. They would just come up behind them and they were killing the women and the kids and the handicapped uh, and just terrorizing the people. We might say they were the terrorist or the jihadist of their day. Uh, and God says to them, you write this down and don't ever forget it. And you're going to be at war with these guys from here on out. And we're going to see as we trace a little bit of the lineage of who these guys are. They become some of the real villains against God's people. There was a reason that he, uh, that he said it. All this coming from, from Esau. But again, did, did this all happen? Did the Lord, in a sense, lay waste uh, to the uh, Edomite kingdom and their stronghold? Uh, yes, he did. And uh, again, the Edomites lived there for uh, several hundred years. Uh, historians tell us by about 550 to 400 BC, they were overrun by uh, Nabataean Arabs who ransacked the whole area. They lived there until about the time of the Crusades and then they're driven out. And basically it sets uh, in, uh, in the dust for hundreds of years until an archeologist finds it in the 1800s. Not much is done to it for a very long time until the uh, tourist industry kind of begins to boom. And those are the only people that go down there. Those are the only people that see it. Again, the scriptures all through Obadiah in particular says, this place is going to be condemned. You think you're well protected. You think you have all the wise men. And he goes on and on because you, you live in the cleft of the rock and so forth. And he describes Petra. He says, but it's not going to do you any good. God's going to bring a judgment against you. God's concerned about the the uh, descendants of Esau, the Edomites, and in this case, the, uh, the Amalekites in particular. And there, there's a very famous uh, one in the Bible. Now, you remember when God wanted to bring judgment against him, he was going to use King Saul. You remember that story? Through the prophet Samuel, he says to Saul, you go down and, as God said, and wipe out the Amalekites. Saul goes down and almost does. <laughs> he just kept some of the best sheep and, <laughs> and everything for him. Uh, and he spared the king, King Agag, remember? And uh, uh, whether he was going to barter, thought he could uh, ransom him, we don't know why he kept him alive. But remember, Samuel goes down and uh, ends up uh, killing uh, King Agag himself. And as he's leaving, you know, Saul reaches out and grabs the robe, the hem of his garment, and it tears. And Samuel turns back and says, as you've torn my robe this day, God is tearing the kingdom from your hands because he, uh, he, he wanted 
obedience rather than sacrifice. Saul was saying, yeah, but I've got a lot of sheep for sacrifice. No, God wants obedience, not sacrifice. So a descendant of King Agag survives. Uh, and he was a guy later that then ends up being destroyed uh, by a young Jewish woman named Esther. And the guy that she destroyed is Haman the Agagite, the descendant of King Agai and Amalekite, who tried to kill all of the Jews in the Babylonian captivity, all the Persian world. God says these are very bad guys. From the very beginning, their name Edom means they could care less about me and the things of God. And it's continued. And now through the Amalekites, they're going to try to try to stop you and kill you now on the way into the promised land. They're going to try to destroy you in the captivity through one of their descendants. But before that even happens, the, uh, the other occurrence is that uh, uh, they end up as Nebuchadnezzar is coming in, as we've been studying in Jeremiah and Isaiah and through Ezekiel. Is, uh, again, the Babylonian captivity is going to happen. And people are fleeing and trying to get out of the city and out of Israel so they won't be destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. As they flee through this area of the Edomites, we find in Scripture that they block the roads and they hold them until the Nebuchadnezzar and his army could get there and destroy every one of them or take them into captivity. So two times they, they play this deadly role and then the, uh, the whole event with, uh, with Haman. Jeremiah says this in, uh, in Jeremiah 49, 7. Against Edom, thus says the Lord of hosts, is wisdom no more in Taman? Has counsel perished from the prudent? Has uh, their wisdom vanished? They, they prided themselves on wisdom. Uh, flee, turn back, dwell in the depths, O inhabitants of Dedan, another name for the same area. For I will bring calamity, uh, the calamity of Esau upon him the time that I will punish him. So, uh, they're known for these things. God says, I'm going to destroy them. And of course, again, most of Obadiah is about the, the destruction uh, and is concerned for the fact that Jacob I've loved, but Esau I've hated because of the descendants and what they end up uh, doing. So it ends up being, uh, in a sense, uh, a great tragedy. There's one other great villain that comes from them also. He is an Edomite king. Who, who kills all of the babies in Bethlehem as he's trying to destroy the Messiah. He's known as Herod the Great, the Edomite, who comes from, from Esau. Uh, these end up being some people and a group of people through generations that because they had a disdain and they could care less for God and they wanted to live for right now and my pleasures and what I could get today and could care less about eternity, the future, or honoring God, or in contrast to a man like Moses who would give up everything of a worldly sense and wealth and power in order to be associated with God's people, no matter what it would cost him, because he knew someday he would be with the Lord for all eternity. There's a real contrast between uh, these two men. So we'd say lastly, kind of a summary statement, Esau's family received God's judgment because they would not repent. Uh, you know, these aren't the only people that, you know, uh, you know, rebelled against God. But we see that, uh, you know, others like Ruth, who was a Moabite, who ends up in the uh, genealogy of, uh, of Jesus Christ. We see others that, uh, that come to faith in Christ that, uh, from these uh, areas, but, uh, but not any of these. It all starts out when Esau marries a Canaanite woman. Uh, they become known as the Edomites because it, he could care less about his own birthright. Uh, they continue to build as a nation uh, while the children of Israel are in slavery uh, in Egypt. And you can look at the two at that time and say, I would rather be an Edomite than an uh, Israelite any time. But God, uh, God sees it from a different perspective. Again, for Obadiah, I've mentioned him a few times. Uh, it's just one chapter in verse 17. It says, but on Mount Zion there shall be deliverance. And there shall be holiness. The house of Jacob shall, shall possess their possessions the house of Jacob shall be a fire and the house of Joseph a flame. But, the contrasting word, the house of Esau shall be stubble. They shall kindle them and devour them and no survivor shall remain of the house of Esau for the Lord has, has spoken. And uh, pretty final ending simply because they, they would, not, uh, would not repent. Again, we've got a lot of folks around us that live for uh, the next game, the next meal, <laughs> the next whatever it might be. 
uh, and, and they think that this is it, you know, everything right, uh, right now. Uh, I read a, uh, an article by uh, Herschel York, who's a Baptist uh, seminary professor and pastor, and he was talking about Esau in this chapter in particular, uh, and he, w- he was talking about those things I was mentioning. The way the, uh, the ancients in the Near East measured the blessing of God, it was the number of your children, it was the size of your herds, and it was how much land you had. And, and Esau had them all in spades. And, uh, and everybody looking at him would say, oh, I want to be like Esau. Uh, very few people would be saying, I want to be like Jacob, who lived in a tent, uh, who lost his wife, who lost his favorite son. Uh, who ends up, uh, you know, uh, just, you know, time of famine, what are we going to do, you know, and uh, the suffering that, uh, that he went through. Uh, but uh, in the article, he goes on and says, um, isn't it interesting, what does, uh, what does that, these ideas, tell us about Genesis 36? Why did God, through the Holy Spirit, go to the trouble, including this list of Esau descendants uh, that also boast of their wealth? I think two great truths emerge from Genesis 36. One, if this is how God treats those who really hate him, uh, he truly is a good and a gracious God. And two, you best not mistake material blessing for spiritual blessing. In distinction to Esau, there's Jacob, uh, God's favored one. What did Jacob got? He got a tent. He lived his entire life in a tent with his father, Isaac, his grandfather, Abraham. Never had a house. They were, uh, lived nomadic lives, always wondering about Yet we live in an age of Christianity where we value Esau more than Jacob. We interpret the goodness of God more by the blessings of Esau than by the favor God bestowed upon Jacob. If Esau lived today, we'd put him on TV. He'd sit there on the couch and we'd ask him, tell us how God has blessed you and how we can have it as well. And Jacob wouldn't be invited to go anywhere. Nobody would want to hear his story. It's kind of where we're at, isn't it? I mean, it's, and this, this curtain certainly is bleeding it over into the, the life of, uh, of the church today and believers. Now, we make the contrast between people that don't know Christ, and we even kind of get it. You know, they live for pleasure, and they don't have the concept of eternity and so forth, and we need to pray for them and share the gospel with them. Part of the problem is that this concept of the Esau Jacob in the church today, in some churches, Esau would be the popular guy. He'd be the guy we'd want to interview and put on TV. Because, I mean, he's got, he's got a whole country named after him. Man, that is, that is a great guy. Look at all the kids. Look at all the wealth. God sure is blessing him. Jacob, are you kidding me? I wouldn't want to be in that guy's shoes. That, that, that is a perspective. But uh, we don't want it to be our perspective. We want to have the, the perspective of uh, all eternity, as Paul says, to, to set our thoughts on, on things above. He says, because the things that you can see, those are the things that are passing away. It's the things you can't see that will be for all eternity.